So if algebra is really about simplifying expressions and solving equations, that means that in any abstract algebraic setting, we really kind of need to know how to do two things. How do we use the composition laws in a group, in other words, the group operation, to simplify an expression? And then also, how do we find the inverses of elements so that we could solve equations that those elements participate in? In this video, we'll look at how to use cycle notation for permutations to discover the inverses of permutations. So let's look at the inverse of this five cycle, one, six, three, eight, five. So what is its inverse? I want to first do that using stack notation. Again, this is not probably the way that you're ultimately going to do these computations, but I want to reinforce sort of why what we're about to do for the shortcut using cycles works the way that it works. So remember what inverse means. An inverse is an element that we can compose using the group operation with my cycle in question in order to get the identity. So when I do this composition of two uh, permutations, I should end up with a permutation in which nothing happens, where every element stays exactly where it started. So remember, when we compose permutations together, we're sort of forgetting what's happening in this intermediate step, where the output of the first one is being fed into the input of the second one. So we kind of have to do a little bit of backwards thinking to fill in those gaps when I look at this in my stack notation. So if I ultimately want nothing to change when I compose these two permutations, I have to figure out again how to undo whatever this permutation does. So when I feed the output of the first one into the input of the second one, the second one needs to undo the first. So what's 16385 do in stack notation? Well, position 1 moves to position 6, position 6 moves to 3, and so forth. But notice that if I'm going to undo this first permutation, then after 1 has moved to position 6, that becomes the sixth input in the second permutation. And the job of the second permutation is then to restore that sixth position back to the first position. So each one of these moves that we're making in the first cycle is going to have to be unmoved by the second. So position 6 going to position 3 in my first cycle is going to have to be restored back to position 6 in the second cycle. 3 going to 8 means the second cycle is going to have to move 8 back to 3. 8 going to 5 means the second cycle is going to have to move 5 back to 8. And in the first cycle, 5 returns to 1, which means in the second cycle, 1 has to go back to 5. So now I've got kind of a cycle notation looking thing drawn in here for my inverse, my second permutation. Um, but it's not in the usual cycle fashion that we would write down, the usual stack notation, uh, because the first row isn't 1 through 8 in a linear order. So if I really wanted to find a stack notation for this, then what I would have to do is write down 1 through 8, uh, up here at the top, and then figure out what happens to each one of those numbers. So in the first position, it's moving over to the fifth position. So that 1 here is going to end up underneath this 5. Um, 2 is going to end up uh, still in the second position. 3 is going to end up in the sixth position, uh, and so on and so on. So I could write down stack notation uh, for this, and I don't know that it would be particularly illuminating uh, to do so, because uh, it's not easy to tell, uh, at least at a glance, how this permutation is related to the first one uh, that we had written down here. So ultimately, we are going to want to have cycle notation for this inverse. And it turns out that if we figure out this cycle notation for this stack, uh, then it'll give us a clue as to what we should do. So starting from position 1, we find out in this stack, position 1 goes to 5. And then 5 goes to 8. 8 goes to 3. 3 goes to 6. And then 6 returns back to position 1, which means I've finished my cycle. So the first thing that we notice is that the inverse of my original 5 cycle ends up being also a 5 cycle. And that kind of gives us some reassurance. Uh, as we'll see in a couple of videos, the cycle type or the cycle length of a permutation determines a lot of its most salient features. Uh, and so it's not too surprising that a cycle and its inverse will have the same cycle type. That's something that we could prove uh, if we were prepared to do so right now. Um, but is there a simpler way to understand where this 5 cycle actually comes from that can help us in computations? And it turns out there absolutely is. Because uh, if we sort of squint at what we just did, um, this inverse, 15836, is exactly what we would have gotten by reading our original cycle, not in the usual fashion where I read from left to right, 1 goes to 6, goes to 3, goes to 8, goes to 5, which returns to 1. But if I instead read that cycle from right to left. I would say, well, in the inverse, 
1 has to go to position 5, which has to go to 8, which has to go to 3, which has to go to 6, which has to return to 1. And that's exactly what's happening in my inverse. 1 goes to 5, which goes to 8, which goes to 3, which goes to 6, which goes back to 1. So that's the great news. After the last five minutes of my talking, you can take away that shortcut if you like. To find the inverse of a K cycle, you're going to get another K cycle. And all you have to do to find it is just read the original cycle backwards. So that tells me how to take the inverse of an individual cycle. So how then do we take the inverse of any permutation? Well, if we're convinced that every permutation can be written as a product of cycles, then we have to find the inverse of a product, this theorem that works in absolutely any group, the shoes and socks theorem. The inverse of a product is the product of the inverses just taken in the opposite order. So for example, if I wanted to find the inverse of this product of, of disjoint cycles, then I would just take the inverses of those cycles in the opposite order. So the inverse of 2, 3, followed by the inverse of 1, 8, 7, 5. Well, what's the inverse of 2, 3? I just have to read that cycle backwards. So rather than going left to right, I'll go right to left. So the inverse of 2, 3 will be 2, followed by, reading backwards, 3, which is then going to go back to 2. So remember, any transposition, a 2 cycle, it's its own inverse. So 2, 3 inverse is again 2, 3. Then the inverse of 1, 8, 7, 5, I can just read this 4 cycle backwards to get 1, 5, 7, 8. And there's the inverse of that product. So this is great. Now we have a recipe for finding the inverse of any permutation at all. Once we've expressed it in cycle notation, first of all, if it's made up of multiple cycles, we can use the shoes and socks principle to just say that the inverse of that product is the product of the inverses in the opposite order. If the cycles were disjoint, it turns out that the order doesn't matter, right? Because disjoint cycles commute. But even if they weren't disjoint, I could still use shoes and socks to say that the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses in the opposite order. And then for each of those inverses, the inverse of a cycle is a cycle that we get just by reading the original cycle backwards from right to left instead of from left to right. 